Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang damang sangang namasami So today, I, someone I know asked for a discussion about the changing nature of happiness and suffering in the Buddhist uh, conception of what we refer to as dukkha and sukkha. Um, so etymologically, dukkha is uh, related to the word for a an, an axle of a wheel, which is slightly off. Du means bad, and ka is the word for this axle. So the sense in life that things aren't quite as they should be, um, all the way up to the most coarse and brutal forms. And there's a sutta, um, Majjhima Nikaya 137, uh, the exposition on the sense bases. And in it, the Buddha says, there are these 36 states to which beings are attached, and these should be known. There are six kinds of householder joy and six kinds of renunciant joy. What are the six kinds of householder joy? The joy that arises when one regards as an acquisition, the acquisition of forms pleasing to the eye, endearing, pleasing, connected with worldly baits, or recalls the past acquisition of such forms after, after they have passed, ceased, and changed. This is household joy. And what is renunciation joy? The joy that arises when experiencing the change fading and cessation of those very same forms, one realizes with right discernment that all forms, past and present, are inconstant, variable, and subject to change. This is renunciation joy. And then he goes through the other five sense bases, uh, so to make six total, and uh, that would be the ear, tongue, smell, sight, touch, and then the mind. And I think there's a great deal going on in the sutta that gets missed, or which one can skip over if it's not read carefully. The six kinds of household joy he speaks of, the regarding of, of an acquisition of forms pleasing to the eye, of sounds pleasing to the ear, of uh, all these different sense impressions which the world chases after, um, is something we're all familiar with, I think. But it's a bit more confusing to try to understand what he's speaking about with the renunciation joy. That when one experiences the fading and cessation of these forms, their changing nature, and sees that with right discernment, that there's a joy in that as well. And 
I think this is one of the great insights of the spiritual path is that as we let go of the things and the stimulus and the constant seeking which we've spent our whole lives devoted to, running after, that what's left is not nothing. That a quiet but much more subtle and sweet or a much sweeter um, joy comes to fill that space. And I think this is the wisdom of the Catholic cathedrals that when you create a space carefully with intention and build those walls to keep out the hustle and movement that characterizes so much of the world, then suddenly something profound has a chance to grow and you aren't left with a blank space for long. It can feel like that at first after you step in from the street and the movement of cars or passers-by, the calls of various people in the town. The silence can feel dead or deadening. And yet as you remain in that cathedral, in that space, you begin to notice the more subtle elements all around you, the uh, incense, the singing, the way the light from the rose window falls on the floor. All these things have a chance to become apparent. And I think this is something of what the Buddha is pointing to in this sutta is that when we depend for our happiness on these joys that are so tied to this sense world, uh, not just of the coarse ones which we all know are suspect, but even the satisfaction and security from a good relationship, something like this, or from an, uh, a beautiful experience out in uh, you know, a camping trip or a rafting trip. And these all have their own sublime elements to, to them. And they're certainly better than the more uh, coarse um, desires that we all know are bad for us, like Netflix and such. But still these ways of finding happiness we intuit are fragile and something in us knows that they are not a refuge and that eats away at us at a deep uh, level where we know we can't trust these things which we're dependent on and the Buddha speaks of three levels of happiness in another sutta. Um, there's Amisa Sukha, which is sort of worldly happiness and things based on these sense spheres, these senses which we just spoke of. And then there's Niramisa happiness or otherworldly pleasure, spiritual pleasure. And this is the pleasure of concentration, of a unified mind of morality, of love, and loving-kindness. And then the third level of happiness is that of complete liberation. And each of these levels of happiness is characterized not just by the subtlety and refinement of the taste of it, but also with its fragility. The happiness most of us depend on is 
tied to external conditions and if the body fails or the people around us change or cease to treat us like we want to be treated, then the happiness goes as well. But this next level of Niramisa Sukha, spiritual joy, is based on something internal, the internal qualities of morality, uh, of unification of mind, and of loving kindness. And, and the third level, of course, is free from all conditions, even internal. But I think as we practice, we begin to get a sense for that second level of happiness, of spiritual joy. What happens if we keep the precepts of not lying, of not killing, of never taking what's not given uh, for anything? And over the course of time, a deep and profound sense of self-worth develops. And what's difficult is that this happiness takes time to manifest. It isn't apparent at first. In the first verse of the Dhammapada, the Buddha says that suffering follows the ill-trained mind like the wheel of a cart follows the ox whereas happiness follows the trained mind like a shadow that never leaves. And in this image, the wheel of the cart is coarse and easy to see. And our suffering and also our more coarse pleasures which we rely on and have relied on are easily visible, and it's why we become fixated. But these more sublime supports for ourselves are subtle, and it takes a while for our eyes and ears to adjust so that we can feel and see them. And this is why a spiritual community is so valuable and why a leap of faith is sometimes necessary to an extent that one begins to practice meditation a bit, even though at first it can be painful or difficult. Because after a time, that subtle joy or those that sweeter taste which has been obscured by our gluttony for the world becomes more and more apparent and um i've compared that before to the taste of fresh snow it's sweet and subtle but if you just came from a meal uh, at a fast food restaurant you're not going to be able to taste anything And in another sutta, the Buddha says that wherever one finds sukha, that the Tathagata, which was the Buddha's epithet for himself, defines as sukha. Wherever one finds happiness, that is happiness. And this phrase is an intentionally circular definition of happiness of sukha. And I think that's brilliant because what it indicates is that as we practice our definition of happiness and suffering change drastically and dramatically. And so the Buddha leaves room for that. In the same sutta, he speaks about how as you ascend through different levels of meditative attainment, uh, these levels of these uh, qualities of happiness uh, change as well. Um, 
and shift as the practice progresses. And I think we all have that experience of after learning to meditate for a time, you realize something in you has shifted and the thing you formerly knew as a boon in life, the uh, outing with um, or the late night party um, or uh, say a relationship with a certain friend um, starts to seem you start to see the burden in it and the residual taint on the heart afterwards. And what was formerly happiness is now dukkha, is felt to be not satisfactory in the same way. And in the question and answer session last week, someone asked about the difference between dispassion and depression. And I think sometimes they can seem similar because one at times sees the attraction of old parts of one's life fall away. And it can take a while until the new, more subtle joys come to be, come to be apparent. And that can be a difficult time. But I think the distinguishing element of dispassion versus depression is that one is the prisoner in Plato's cave simply going blank out of boredom. And this is depression, whereas the other is that same prisoner turning their head towards a complete unknown behind them that they've never pictured. And yet there's an exhilaration of discovery there. And I think most of us have had that experience of a moment in our life where we felt we stepped into a footstep that was made for us, where uh, an intuition of light has come and of a spiritual purpose higher than these fleeting and fragile things that we spend so much of our lives chasing. And that's the defining feature of Songwega, which is the Pali, which can be translated loosely as dispassion or disenchantment, is that there's a sense also of something great to be done, of a journey to be made, and of a goal that is even higher. But sometimes we must give up what we've had before, before there's room for that new place or that new purpose to manifest. And I think this can manifest practically in many ways. There's simply the fact that as we take on the discipline of meditation and step out of our day for 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, 45 in the morning, 45 in the evening, if we can do it for brief periods during the work day, uh, sitting down and closing our eyes for five minutes to follow the breath, that a we begin to realize that 
that sort of peace that comes with practice is a deeply robust and sustaining happiness. And it's nourishing, especially if we become skilled at developing breath meditation or metta, loving kindness, in a way that so much of the stimulus isn't. Because the stimulus isn't. After two or three decades, I think we all feel this, the sankara, which is the Buddhist term for mental programs, which we run automatically, the ways we are in the world, our personality, how we interact in groups, the introvert, the extrovert, the attention hog, the fearful one, the self-recrimination, all these programs crust over and accumulate until we cannot see the world for them. And only by meditating and stilling the mind and letting the dust settle can we finally see clearly again the morning which we've forgotten, the freshness of the day and the blue evening which we used to know as a child. There's a beautiful uh, poem by Dylan Thomas called uh, Fern Hill, where he speaks about the fall of grace that comes with age. And he says the ending line is, Time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. And I think we all know what that, ha what that feels like. Uh, by the time we're 30, if we haven't found a center and a place of quiet, then what used to give us joy no longer does. And if we haven't aligned ourselves with a deeper purpose, then something deep in us senses not just the fragility of what we are chasing, but also that what we are aiming our lives towards is not worthy of our life and of our death, of our deepest being. And this is the beauty of the sutta which we began with, is that one experiences the change, fading, and cessation of these forms, of these sounds, of these touches, of these smells of the world, and one finds a joy because with, it's not speaking about a complete separation or a cold pushing away of what we know, but rather just that small amount of space we make in our world, that small distance gained from stepping back a little bit through meditation or mindfulness. And if one can do that, step back just a little, then there's room to intuit and hear those more subtle notes and to follow a purpose which is independent of all of those stimulus, all of that stimulus, all the world that, that makes its way through the world, but is not dependent on it in the same sense. And Ajahn Shah used to say, you must hold on to things, but hold them lightly. And this is what meditation practice allows us. And if we can step back just a little, then ironically we become more able to manifest in the world authentically. And this is one of the great paradoxes of spiritual practice in any tradition, is that as we gain a slight degree of separation and, a, and an internal happiness that's more robust and secure, then we feel less need to constantly project 
and manipulate all around us. Because most of us, when we're dependent on the world, never actually get to see the world. All we see are shadows of ourselves. We look at Plato's cave's wall and we see our own shadow. And that is all. Only when we gain that slight amount of distance, when we have an internal source of happiness from meditation, from loving kindness, from a profound sense of self-worth that comes with keeping pure, impeccable morality, from these things, then we can let the world be what the world is and don't need to control it. And we can interact with it with love then we can sit with our friend who's going through suffering and we don't feel intuitively threatened by that suffering. So we can really be there with them compassionately. Then we can live with a loved one, a spouse, a child, a parent, and not try to control them because we need them to be a certain way to fulfill our desires for them. We can give them the love of freedom rather than the love of control, which is no love at all. And this is the paradox embodied in the epithet with the boot, which the Buddha used for himself. Tathagata means both thus come and thus gone, depending on how you parse the Pali. And it's a term that points to the ultimate manifestation of this paradox of perfect transcendence and perfect imminence. That as one takes a slight step back from the world, one learns to manifest in that world with true grace. And that is the Sangha. That is what the saints show us. And in meditation, very practically, this manifests. In the first steps of the mindfulness of breathing sutta, one is following movement. Uh, one is following sense contact of the breath at the nose or uh, throughout the body, the inhalation and the exhalation. And this could correspond in some ways to the joy one gets from these sense spheres. But then as the process of the 16 steps of mindfulness and breathing sutta is a steady and deliberate stepping back towards a greater and greater stability. So initially one is with the rising and falling of the breath, but then in steps three and four of the mindfulness of breathing sutta, one expands the awareness to encompass the whole body and this is a much broader canvas and a much uh, more stable base for consciousness. But still there's a lot of movement in that body. Uh, there's the movement of the breath, there's the movement of the subtle energies, there's various knots um, that one uh, has in the body, such as the a knot at the throat or a tension in the head or a knot in the stomach and one calms those using the breath energy as well, the subtle energy by either visualizing uh, the breath as a, say, bright mist, moving in and relaxing those ten knots of tension, or noticing where one is squeezing the breath in and out of the body and just consciously relaxing that. And this is step four of the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta. And when one does that, then an even more subtle field of awareness of uh, 
refreshment and pleasure manifest, where the whole field of the body uh, becomes pervaded with a subtle energy and joy, which, after it's been drunk up thoroughly by the mind, which is so hungry for that nourishment, settles into a deep stillness. Uh, and this stillness, uh, which is step um, six of the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, in this context, that of uh, sukha or pleasure, uh, which the Buddha compares to a still mountain lake fed by springs below, or that's what he compares the second jhana to. Um, but I find that that image works quite well here as well. And that's frequently when a even more stable nimitta, as we call it in Buddhism, or sign in meditation will manifest. So the breath will fade and uh, a perception of light will come into awareness. Um, or if one has cultivated the sound of silence, which is a meditation object of a subtle hissing or ringing in the ears, which is always apparent, then that will become more and more vibrant. And this far more stable object becomes the focus. And it's always there. The sound of silence is always there. That perception of light at some level is always there, but we're so distracted by everything else we don't see it. And Long Propasano has said that Nibbana, awakening, is always there. It's just that we look past it. And Jung had said something similar, that we miss God because we don't look low enough. It's not quite the same, but... But just to say that you can see very clearly, even in meditation, how we are climbing a ladder and as we reach a hand up towards the next rung, we perceive that to be sukha and joy, uh, engaging, refined, subtle. But then after we've rested and pulled ourselves up a bit, then we find a new rung, which we grasp to. And suddenly we realize that old rung was, had an element of coarseness to it, which we can let go of. And this is how we progress from the in and out motion of the breath to a full bodied, robust awareness to a sensation of the breath, subtle energies moving around the body to a sense of a still field emergent from those energies and frequently associated with light to the sensation of the mind itself and eventually to an unfashioned happiness that goes beyond all articulation which is what the Buddha said uh, awakening was. And the beautiful thing is that these still states that come when we let go just a little bit of the motion that distracts us and fixates us are far brighter and of a higher tenor than anything we've experienced before. And that though Plato's prisoner might feel blinded at first, 
walking from the cave into the meadow that with patience and a degree of faith and a community to hold one, that one can stay there long enough and walk even deeper into that world. Um, and that it's an immense field of blessings. Um, but the Buddha was, in Christianity, there are two means of articulating truth. There's cataphatic, which is saying what God is in Christianity, and apophatic, which is saying what God isn't. And the Buddha, of all teachers in history that I know of, was an apophat, was one of the most dedicated apophatic teachers because he'd seen so many great meditators and masters of his time get caught on these refined states of concentration, and that's the tendency. So what he did was he articulated again and again what we're not, and he pointed and tipped his hat to what Nibbana is, to what complete perfection is, but he didn't articulate it or reify it in detail because he focused instead on the fact that all we need to do to get there is to let go. And when we've let go of everything or not, then we'll step into that and know it for ourselves. But when that articulation is taken into a Western dry materialist context, then it can seem uh, completely negative. And we can forget that as we experience the change, fading, and cessation of those very forms, of those pleasures we've known, of those old ways of life that we've followed, as we experience their fragility and step away just a little bit, as we duck out of the party a little bit early to go back to our house and sit, that we're not left with nothing and that our sacrifice is actually in the service of a great gain, that we sacrifice what is not of meaning for what is of the greatest meaning which we could hope for. And this is why I think the modern teachers speak more explicitly of the deathless, like Long Poor Sumedho, of the chitta, of the mind, heart, like Long Poor uh, Suchitto. They're pointing to the fact that as we move on this path, as we let go of those lower rungs, that the joy that comes to us is a great gift and one worthy of a little bit of difficulty in the interim. So I think one useful thing we all have to sustain us through those difficult periods is the community, whether it be on YouTube live chat or otherwise. And we have one another. Yes, so let's see what other, if there's any other things people want to discuss about. Hana, I, hello Hana, hello Ben. I have trouble understanding what I have often hear as binary, the coarse mundane versus subtleness, stillness, pleasures of highest, of higher tenor. Could you speak to why the distinction known to be good uh, it could you speak to the to why this distinction is known to be good or whether the distinction is wrong? It's a really good question. I'd say that it's an imperfect distinction. 
the Buddha spoke of suffering as two arrows. You have the suffering of the world, uh, which is loss, separation, grief. Um, and this is, this is the arrow of the world. Um, things are imperfect. Uh, we are naturally uh, imperfect, awkward, strange, neurotic, broken creatures. But then there's the second arrow, which we shoot ourselves with. And that's how we compound those difficulties by always wanting things to be otherwise, by uh, taking that small seed of, say, a difficult situation and turning it into a problem we obsess over day after day, of taking a small mood of grumpiness and turning it into uh, hatred, something like this. That's the second arrow. And um, that's what the Buddhist path addresses. But the first arrow is just what we get coming into the world. And I'd say that there's a similar, uh, maybe one can apply that articulation a bit to that question of the mundane versus the refined, is that there's nothing wrong with the mundane. It's just, um, it's the first arrow and these experiences uh, I think can be really lovely um, that we live with, you know, I mean, uh, relationships, um, camping trips, um, a good movie, if you're not a monk, uh, are all great things um, or can be fine. Um, I'd say the issue is that is when that's all we know and when that's all we have to sustain us in the long term. And that the path is about stepping back a little bit and realizing that that's not a refuge. And that that's the importance of cultivating this inner, these inner resources of, uh, say, meditative joy, of that peace that is not dependent on those things. Um, and of these more refined states uh, of, say, the deep sense of self-worth and self-esteem that comes with um, keeping very pure morality or having uh, a purpose that is worthy, um, namely the complete liberation of the heart, is that when one steps back just a little bit and has that those... 30 minutes of meditation in the day, then one can approach all these quote-unquote mundane aspects of life um, and there's no harm in them and they actually can be a venue and a vessel for these deeper qualities to manifest and be cultivated through. You know, the coffee date with a friend is no longer just an opportunity to gossip about someone, but rather, or, you know, talk about whatever. Um, but it's a chance to cultivate love and wisdom with that person. And if we've cultivated these inner resources, then we can be in that experience. And because we have a slight distance from it, we can actually be more present and interact with more grace and respond more skillfully to it. So... Yeah, I'd say it's the distinction, if it's made as having to give up one for the other, that's not necessarily what we're aiming for, but rather, or what the path is speaking to, but rather realizing that because we've been so dependent on one um, for so long, that sometimes it does take a conscious stepping back for a little bit to gain a better sense of these other more uh, refined and robust qualities that are more sustainable. Um, and that's why we you know, meditate and shut off all those uh, external things for times that only with that space can these things become apparent. But then we can reapproach the world and we can hold it lightly instead of in this white-fingered or white-knuckled grip 
which we usually strangle it in. Uh, and then all those quote unquote mundane experiences actually are much fresher than they would be. Maybe that's uh, at least one of my thoughts, but I'd be very curious about yours as well. Um, it's a really good question. I don't know if I did it justice there. Uh, but no, it's just not about giving up all those things. Um, but just realizing where our refuge is.